And thank you for joining me today. This is a community event. Um, chances are if you've been to other sessions, you've, you've seen us talk about these, um, these amazing sponsors that have helped make this event happen. Uh, and without them, like, we can't run an event like DDD at the price point that it's at and an, event, an awesome venue like this. Uh, so uh, make sure you go visit them, get your stamps, try and win the prizes at the end of the day. Um, I'm pretty sure you actually have to be here physically to win the prize as well, so don't go to the pub early unless you don't care about winning the prizes, because I'm going to go to the pub early, because I don't care about winning the prizes. Uh, and anyone who was here earlier, there was a, a really terrible dad joke that I opened with. Uh, expect that level of humour for the rest of this session. Uh, but also, this is a fairly serious topic. Uh, and I... Uh, I can kind of see the reflection of my slides in the screen at the back, but I also can't see them. Um, <laughs> I am going to be talking about some sensitive things today. Uh, so I did want to start off with a trigger warning. Um, there, there will be some topics that might make people feel uncomfortable, and if that's the case, I do understand, and I will not feel any, uh, anything ill towards you if you do feel the need to step out of the room or anything like that. Similarly, uh, if you want to ask questions, um, I'll stick around afterwards, because, um, again, I know that it might be the kind of topic that you're not overly confident discussing in a group setting um, and things like that. Um, but as I said, my name is Aaron Powell. Um, I, I'm from Microsoft. I, I work in developer advocacy. Um, and I'm going to share my journey about burnout. Because at the start of 2023, I wrote this blog post. Um, there's a QR code in the, the bottom corner there. If you want to scan it and, uh, and go read the post as well after the session, um, I'm going to talk about a bunch of the stuff that's in there. But I wrote this post because I was burnt out. And Today, I want to share my journey of how I led to becoming burnt out and then ultimately what comes next from that. Because I feel that's something that we don't talk enough about is the next uh, uh, stage of it, what happens after you've burnt out. It's all good to talk about you know, you know, reducing workloads to ensure people don't burn out, but what happens when they do? But before I can tell you the story exactly of how I burnt out, I, I, I want to tell you a bit about how I found myself in a career, like this is, I guess I'll do an origin story. I've always grown up around technology. Um, my first computer was a 386-66DX. Uh, it had a turbo button on the front because it was actually a 33 megahertz processor and you press the turbo button to make it go faster to 66 megahertz and like who would ever turn that off? Uh, we ran DOS as our primary operating system. We did have Windows but no one booted to that unless you like really desperately needed something in Windows. You were doing things in DOS. Um, uh, I, I built um, token ring networks with my dad. My dad was very into electronics. We built circuits together. And so I was always around computers. I was around electronics. When I went to high school, uh, we had Apple IIEs. I'm really feeling old <laughs> talking about this stuff. D I like dating myself. And the, hearing the chuckles in the audience, I think we're all kind of going, yeah, except Amy down here in the front. She's like a baby. <laughs> Uh, but Apple IIEs were in our computer labs. Uh, eventually, they got upgraded to like Windows 98 machines, and, uh, um, and that's where I got my first taste of, of actual computer programming. Things like QBasic, Logo Writer, like those were the languages that I grew up in. Uh, and the resulting of that was that, well, I was always destined for some kind of career in technology. I didn't necessarily know what that would be, what kind of technology career I'd have. I hadn't really fallen in love with programming through high school. So I went to university uh, and I did a Bachelor of Computing, just like generalized computing course. It, it, it did have um, a bit more of a programming lean to it. So we did things like C and C++, a bit of Java programming, database, shell programming, assembly, you know, those sorts of things. Um, I wasn't a great student, to be honest. Like, kind of a distinction average. So like, to anyone that's studying, remember that Cs do get degrees. I told you the, the quality of jokes were going to be really top-notch today. <laughs> so like, I, I ended up, I, I graduated from, uh, from university. I went and got a job, and um, I've, been doing, uh, I've been doing programming uh, professionally now for about 20 years. Um, and and, and I've, I've loved it. I, I've, I've always enjoyed being a programmer. I've always loved being around technology. But the fact is that I'm a pretty shy person. Might not seem that because I'm standing here in front of an audience presenting, but but I was the shy kid, uh, and I'm, I'm a parent of two young boys. I've got an eight-year-old and a six-year-old, and I look at my childhood experience uh, through the lens of a parent of, of children, and I look at what I was like at that age and how I 
kind of resonate with them. And if I was to think about me now like, and, and the way that I would consider my personality mm -hmm. then is that I probably had some pretty severe social anxieties. I, I was the kid that would hide in the back of the classroom because I didn't want to be asked a question. I was the kid that you didn't really want on your group assignment because like, I might do the work, but I didn't want to present it. I mean, what primary school kid really wanted to present or in front of an audience? But, but I would do everything I could to just not be noticed. I don't want to be that center of attention because yeah, at the end of the day, that's, that's who I was. I was, I was shy or as we would probably now say, I, was, I, I had a level of social anxiety. Growing up as a child of the 90s, mental health wasn't a particularly big topic that we would discuss. And my parents are both from rural Australia. Um, my mum's from a farming family and farming community. My dad's from an equally rural part of Australia. And like, those kinds of communities kind of even compound it further, the topic of mental health. It wasn't a topic that we would discuss. No, particularly not like we do today. You know, there, was, there was no one getting up on a stage and talking about burnout or anything like that. Um, we, we would just kind of ignore it. Um, so I, I look at that then through, the, you know, through my learned experience. And uh, my sister struggles a lot with mental health. Uh, she's bipolar. Uh, but growing up uh, in her mid-teens when she was first diagnosed, she was diagnosed as depressed, eventually became manic depressive, um, and then finally a bipolar uh, diagnosis. So I've been through suicide attempts with her. Um, I've had the call to, to go pick her up from a hospital or to find her somewhere because she's, she's had um, an episode, she's, she's had an attempt. She's had issues with uh, substance abuse over the years, um, addiction, things like that. And, and she's, she's never, like, you're never going to be cured from that kind of stuff. It's always going to be part of her personality. So I look at it in my personality, like what, what similar traits do I have? We, we, say, we share a lot of the common genetic markers. And obviously, not all of them, she's my sister. <laughs> but where we then look back at our family tree. Uh, and we're pretty confident that my, uh, my grandma on my mom's side was probably bipolar. Um, I have some aunts and uncles that they've got clear mental health issues that have just unresolved, undiagnosed. Uh, similar with my parents. So it's always something that I've been probably acutely aware of in of, of myself because I see it, I see the experience. And I say growing up as a kid in the 90s, we didn't talk about it. My parents did everything they could to shield me from that. They didn't want me to be burdened in the way that they felt they were being burdened by it. Um, and that's kind of hard, right? Like it, it's hard as the brother of, of someone who's struggling that your parents are wanting to not talk about this sort of stuff. But then, I, because, I, because I was the shy kid though, um, everyone just assumed that I was, I was fine, that I was, I was a, you know, that, that stoic, silent type, like a strong silent type. But the reality is there's kind of that analogy of the, the duck swimming across the surface of the pond. You know? I might seem calm and collected on the surface, but that, you don't see what's happening under the water. You don't see the duck's feet are going a million miles an hour to keep it you know, in the direction they're trying to go, fight against the current that it might be swimming against or whatever the case may be. I actually remember uh, in my uh, in late high school career, I think it was like, it was probably around the year 12 exam time, uh, my mum said to me, uh, I don't think you're capable of getting stressed. You seem so calm about the exams that are upcoming. You know, nothing seems to bother you. <laughs> really, that was, that was far from the truth. Like, we've all done year 12. Like, you know, oh, like, okay, sorry. I'm pretty sure that most people here have done year 12. <laughs> but... Uh, th those exams are stressful. But I feel that I had that level of self-awareness um, that maybe some of my peers didn't have because they, weren't, uh, they didn't have kind of some of the similar things going on at home. Um, uh, uh, I, was, I was aware of some of my stresses uh, and, and trigger points, even at that early, early age. Um, I, I, as I said before, I wasn't a great student, uh, but a bunch of my best mates are. I have some of my best mates were top of our class. They, they, they got near perfect marks at the end of year 12. And I realized early on that I wasn't gonna be like them. I was never gonna have that same level of academic ex, uh, excellences that they were achieving. So I had to just be me. I had to lean into my strengths. 
and not try and keep up with them just because I thought I could and I thought I should, maybe more accurately. The first time I probably really had a mental health break was in 2008, or 2009. 2008, I'd just moved out of home. Um, uh, while I live in Sydney now, I, I actually grew up in Melbourne. I was living in St Kilda at the time. I was living in a one-bedroom apartment by myself. Um, and coming into the start of 2009, uh, my girlfriend at the time uh, broke up with me. We'd been together for six years, and now I'm living on my own. I lost pretty much all of my friends because they were friends that I'd acquired through her, and I would, I'd go to work. Like I didn't, I didn't have a whole lot of other things going on in my life that I, to kind of fall back on, and and I could feel the first signs that I might be slipping here, that I might be, maybe not burning out was the right one at that point in time, but I, I could definitely see something was was not right. Um, but I didn't know how to deal with it, so I dealt with it the only way that I thought I could, and I fell back to the only thing I could control, and that was code. I was working as a programmer in the CBD. Um, I'd go to work, I'd write code, and I'd come home, and I'd write code. Like, literally, that was all I was doing. Um, and uh, and I was, it, was, it was an outlet because it was the only, like I said, it was the only thing I knew I could control and I could understand and that was giving me a level of comfort. But I was looking for something through that. And what I found was open source software. And I found a community through that. I met a whole bunch of people that I would never have met if I hadn't have gotten involved in that kind of stuff. Um, I started contributing to, turns out they're a sponsor. I had no idea until um, yesterday when I saw the sponsors, um, Umbraco. Um, I actually started contributing to Umbraco, uh, and that's what got me uh, initially involved in open source. Um, and doing that, I got invited to uh, the Umbraco conference in Denmark in 2009. And that was kind of a pivot point for me. I was still pretty miserable at that point, and I, and I had to make a decision. Like, how was I going to address this? Was I going to stay at home, keep writing code, potentially start you know, drinking a bit more or anything like that? Or do I, do I try that step outside of my comfort zone? Um, so I did. I, I, I ended up going to the conference in Denmark. Um, I, I had no idea where Denmark was. Kudos to the Australian education system. I, <laughs> That is a really long way away. <laughs> but but I, I, I went there and I met a whole bunch of people that I would never have met in person. And um, one of the people that I met there uh, was from Sydney. He was working at a, a, a company. He was a technical director. And they were looking for a senior developer and was like, hey, why don't you come work for us? I was like, well, I mean, I live in Melbourne. Remote work this wasn't a thing really back then. But I was like, you know what? Why not? Like. Maybe this is the push that I need to, to, to help me get through what I'm experiencing at the moment. So I came back, um, I resigned from my job, which annoyed my boss because he'd given me the leave to go there and was really excited because we were using Umbraco at work. Um, and they also had a Sydney office and he said, if you wanted to move to Sydney, you could have stayed working for us. And I said, no, here's my resignation. Um, and I moved to Sydney. I didn't know anyone in Sydney though. Uh, I had a few no, like extended family in there, but I, they were the kind of family you would see at holidays and things like that, so not particularly close with them. Um, and I was, was living with my, my now boss, um, and I got a lot more self-destructive. Um, it turns out there was a radically different drinking culture in Sydney to what I was used to in Melbourne, and I, I, I really spiralled massively. Uh, and at the end of 2009, I was like, you know what? I can't keep doing this. Maybe, like, maybe I'm done. Maybe I have to move back to Melbourne. But I decided to give it one last crack um, and ended up, ended up staying there. Uh, but I, I started trying to find a community, building up a network. Uh, and I, I, I started connecting with people in the Sydney tech scene. And the resulting of that was that they started talking about something that I think has changed my life. And that was this little conference called DDD Melbourne. This is the 10th time I've spoken at DDD Melbourne. I've been voted in 10 of the 11 times it's happened. And I'd only missed one year because I didn't submit to that year because it was scheduled to be the same weekend as my oldest son was to be born. And I figured I should probably stay in Sydney for that one. <laughs> he came a week early. I could have done both. <laughs> I possibly wouldn't be married, though. <laughs> 
but I, I, I met all these amazing people at DDD Melbourne, uh, and and I, I I gave a talk, and it was it was everything that I was looking for, and it, it was the thing that made me realize that there was something else to to do to achieve in my career that I I could push forward that. I needed to change something about the way that I was living my life because it wasn't healthy. Uh, and I went back and, uh, and, and kind of really kick-started that next phase of, of, of my career. And as an outsider looking at the career that I've had, um, I, I, I kind of think that it's been a fairly successful career. And I, I don't mean to sound arrogant or anything like that, but I, I've... Uh, going to DDD Melbourne, I got invited to work for, um, to, uh, to apply for and then eventually join Redify, who was arguably the best .NET consulting company at the time. I wish they still existed, but <laughs> that's another story. Uh, yeah, I've heard some ooh in the audience because they know that story. Um, but I, I, I was working with people that were seen as like leaders in, uh, in the .NET community. I was, I was getting invited to talk at um, tech conferences. I kept coming back to Diddy Melbourne. Um, I went to Diddy Brisbane, Diddy Perth. We started running Diddy Sydney, uh, and again, like everything, as you as as an outside observer of my life, seemed to be going amazingly. I, I met someone in Sydney. We got married. We bought a house. We had some kids. You know, all those things that sound amazing as a life. But what you don't see is the things that didn't work out. I applied at Microsoft multiple times. My dream was to join Microsoft. I got. I, I had had friends that were there, and they they uh, sent me roles. They put me forward as recommendations, and I burnt out amazingly in those interviews. Like, failed technical um, the technical interviews so fantastically that I was surprised they're still talking to me to this day. Um, uh, you don't see that because you know that's not the kind of stuff that we talk about. Um, I uh, I got offered a job at an Australian startup, uh, and I uh, and I ended up turning it down because I didn't. I wasn't as confident as they were that they were going to be successful, and I walked away from a, a, a stock offer with them, and they did go IPO, and their stock is now worth like hundreds of dollars, and they were cents in the dollars. So, like, it, it's stuff like that where you go, well, yeah, I, I I made decisions, but I, they I feel like they were the right decisions, but they're they're things that if you saw the full picture of my career, you'd go, hang on, you know, maybe it's not all sunshine and rainbows, like you know, an outlook outside observer might uh, experience. But then in 2019, I got the job that I'd been looking, looking for, for for years, and that was in developer advocacy at Microsoft. It's the role I'm still in today, uh, and I absolutely love it. I've, I've been doing it for just on five years now, and uh, I, it was all the things that I loved doing outside of the job that I actually had to do uh, to you know, earn a paycheck coming to events, talking to people like yourselves, learning what you're doing, sharing my experience and that kind of stuff. And then I burnt out. Yes, there was this COVID thing that happened through 2020 and 2021, and, and I, that obviously plays a lot of impact into how, um, how a lot of us have experienced the last couple of years. But uh, I don't, for me, that wasn't really as triggering a factor as I think it could have been. I was working for a team that was based in, in the US, so I was already used to remote work. My, um, uh, my, my boss was, was overseas and, and all that sort of stuff, but, but at the start of, or kind of the middle of 2022, uh, I was doing my end of year review with uh, a new incoming manager. This was gonna be my eighth manager in three and a half years. I had an average manager retention rate of five months. If I didn't have the ego I had, I would almost take it personally. <laughs> but it was really hard. Like, I, I, and, and now looking back on it, that was kind of the first stages of me feeling truly burnt out. So I was having my review with my manager and my outgoing manager, who had only been at the company for six months. I'd helped onboard them. I'd helped them get settled and, and you know, be a manager of the team that we were in. Um, and uh, they, they, they were moving on to become my um, to become my skip manager or my manager's manager, and uh, my, my new incoming manager. Uh, they were based in Europe, which anyone that works with people in Europe knows that that's a really actually like it's a terrible time zone to work as an Australian. Like there was just never a time that the two of us were going to be online to to collaborate and to work together. Um, most of my managers up to that point had been based in the US, which is still not great, but it's it's not too bad, it's very workable. Europe is really, really hard to be workable unless you're just gonna work nights. 
Um, or you live in a country, uh, another part of Australia where no one actually wants to live. <laughs> that was Perth. <laughs> but we were, doing, we were doing our interview review and I got some uh, positive praise from you know, helping this uh, manager on board who was now moving on to become my skip. Um, and, uh, but but they were, at the same time, I was the most senior person in our team and they were, uh, the feedback I was getting was that I needed to start stepping up. I needed to start, you know, pushing more as that senior person in the team. Uh, and I, I, I probably like, mumbled something to the affirmative of, yep, I should. Uh, while it was never explicitly said, the undertone of it was that if I didn't start doing something, I was looking at a performance improvement plan or a PIP. You'd think that'd be a wake-up call, but it, it wasn't for me. It was just like, yeah, again, like mumbled something to the affirmative and, and, and stuff like that. Because at this point in time, uh, I was working in the JavaScript advocacy team, advocacy team, and we'd been working on the same product for two years at this point. It was arguably a, a little bit of a niche product. Uh, our entire team, we had five, uh, five advocates, and we were all working on this exact same thing. And, and I, I kept raising to our management chains that we needed to tackle something else as well, because we were becoming too pigeonholed. We were too focused on just that one thing and there's like so much more that we could be doing that would be providing impact and you know, yep sure and then we'd have a new manager and then we'd have to reset and start again and, and constantly rinse and repeat. The next you know, few weeks leading into the next few months uh, I don't remember. I don't remember really being at work at that point. Like, I know I got up, I'd log on in the morning and I'd just stare at a screen. I was, I, I was just zoning out day in, day out because, and, and now looking back at this time in my, my life, this is when I was clearly deep into my, my uh, experience of burnout was that, yeah, I just, I didn't care. I didn't have anything to do. I didn't feel like I was doing anything productive anyway. So I just, I would just scroll social media because it was nowhere near the dumpster fire. It was just more of a trash can fire at that point. Um, I, I would, you know, look at teams to a message would pop in and I'd respond to it immediately because I didn't have anything else that I was really doing. Uh, and I, I had a, I had my, my connect or my, my, my goal setting um, exercise with my manager and it's like, and it just made, made the joke of, well, yeah, we'll revisit this in five months when you're rolled, on, like, when you're rolled off elsewhere and I get a new manager and you know that <laughs> everyone has that awkward laugh together and it's not really a laugh because it's not actually funny, but you, like, you kind of understand that it's awkward. And it's just like, because I just didn't care. I just didn't care at that point. In November 2022, uh, we went on a family holiday, went up the coast, um, wife and kids, um, her parents, her aunt and uncle, cousin, and you know, we had an extended family. Big, big family holiday. We were away for a week by the beach. Um, turned off all the work stuff on my phone, as as you should be doing on a holiday anyway. But you know, we're uh, most of us are probably Type A personalities, and we're not doing that. We're still checking emails when we shouldn't be checking emails. But you know, I, I made a very conscious effort to turn that off this time. Um, but I still took my laptop with me because I. <laughs> it was a safety blanket to a degree. Like, I, I've been around technology for so long that just not having a computer with me just feels unusual. Like, I don't travel without a computer of some variety because it just, it's something that I feel I need to have. Uh, I, I probably told myself at the time that, you know, maybe I'd be inspired to write some code. I hadn't written code for, like, weeks at this point. Why was this going to be any different? And then we came back from that week away and I realised that I hadn't touched a computer for a week. And for the first time, as long as I could remember, I wasn't bothered by that. I'm someone who would love my job. I love writing code. I love playing with new technology. I love experimenting and prototyping and all that sort of stuff. And I realized that the fact that I didn't care about any of this stuff, that was the wake-up moment that I needed. Not the fact that I could be on a, uh, on a pip, that I, I could find myself trying to get managed out of the dream job that I was in, the fact that I hadn't touched a computer for a week was my wake-up call. I realized that I was burnt out. I needed to do something about this. I, I, I talked to my wife, but you know, like, we needed to tackle something at work for this, obviously. So I, needed, I didn't know quite what to do. 
I was really struggling to build a rapport with my manager because they were just they were, they were based in Europe and you know, um, half my team was also in Europe, the other half was in the East Coast US. So I wasn't working with any of my colleagues. I was really struggling to have that kind of um, rapport built up anywhere. I, I, so I ended up turning to my skip manager because they'd been my manager previously uh, and, and we had a good working relationship. They'd helped onboard them and things like that. I reached out to them and we scheduled a one-on-one um, in December. Uh, um, and going into that, that was the hardest one-on-one -on -one that I think I've ever been in. And I'd been a manager for a period of time. I, I'd actually had to deliver a PIP to someone. Um, I, I'd had to, and ultimately we ended up managing that person out of the company. So I, I, I had done the hard stuff from a managerial side, but now this was me. I was the one that had to be vulnerable here. And after some you know, pleasantries and discussions and stuff like that, I said to them, oh, I'm feeling burnt out and I don't know what to do. I've been to plenty of talks over the years about burnout, how to identify burnout. Didn't help me. I didn't identify that in myself until it was too late. But now I'm burnt out and I didn't know where to go next. So now what? What do you do when you find yourself in that situation? And this was the conversation we were having because it wasn't so much of a, how do we reduce your workload? It's too late for that. Already not doing anything. So what do we do? How do we, how do we go forward from this? And it's not like, a, how do we fix you? Because that's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to fix you. You're not broken. Well, you're not broken in the way that we think of broken and something needs to be fixed. But we, how, do we, how do we move on from this so that you regain the confidence that you're looking for, that you regain the sense of self or the sense of worth that you might be aiming for. And I didn't kind of know what I was ultimately looking to achieve out of this. I, I, but having at first admitted that I was burnt out to someone in my management chain, already I was feeling lighter about it. I felt, I felt a little bit better. Someone else was going to be able to help me and uh, they, they empathized, they'd been through burnout themselves, they, they could understand what I was going through uh, and they could help me go, uh, go forward because I didn't know where to go. So I went away and started thinking about what were the things that I thought that I needed because at the end of the day, no one can tell you how to recover from burnout. They could give you advice on things that have worked for them or things that have, they, they've learned about over their years of experience, but no one can tell you what's going to fix you or what, what you need to do. The only person that can tell you that is you. I decided that for me, I needed to be selfish. Uh, at this point, I'd been in the JavaScript advocacy team for three years. I'd been the most senior person in that team and we'd been through countless managers. I don't like, we're, yeah, manager eight at this point. Um, and and I, I I had always been the most senior person in that team and because we constantly, you know, managers come, managers go, um, that meant that we were getting new objectives that our team was working on and so on and so forth. I, I tried to be that continuous thread of, not management, but uh, seniority of, of responsibility, like of, of process and all that sort of stuff. And I was becoming more and more aware that I just wasn't passionate about JavaScript, at least not in the way that it was impactful for an advocacy team. And no disrespect to anyone that loves JavaScript. I still do really enjoy JavaScript, but it was no longer something that I felt that I could be passionate about, that I could be productive in, or that I could contribute anything meaningful for. And I said to my, I said to my skip, it's time that I do something that I've wanted to do for a while and I haven't had the courage to do it, but I feel like I've earned the right to request this and that was to move into the .NET advocacy team. And because my career started in .NET and I wanted to get back into .NET more as a day-to-day -day job and that was, I, I saw that was the thing that, that could help me out and that's what I wanted to, to go about. Over the Christmas break uh, of end of um, 2022, uh, I, I sat down and I wrote this blog post. Um, I wrote it in a single pass and hit publish. I didn't proofread it, didn't do any like reread of it. I think I've actually read it in its entirety since I hit publish. I just wrote it, I didn't tell anyone I was gonna write it and send it out to the world. Um, uh, I have a syndication that automatically tweets or at least it did until Twitter did a Twitter. Uh, uh, okay, so the, the first time anyone, or first time most people knew about this was 
this blog post went out and it got posted to social media. And for me though, writing is something that I've always loved. I've been writing on my blog for since 2008. I've over 550 articles up there because I just, I love to write. I love to tell a story. Anyone that has actually read my blog post will be like, oh, it's like reading a recipe. It's like a whole stack of stuff at the top and you get down to the little meaty bit at the bottom that you actually cared about. Oh, there's the ingredients finally. Why did I read War and Peace first? Um, but I, I, I love it. I love crafting a narrative. I love being able to share something and I do waffle on. I'm very well aware of that. And the, when, when I was burning out, I, I just I stopped doing that. I stopped doing something that I enjoyed something that I'd found cathartic to me. But writing this, just essentially pouring my heart out into a blog post and hitting publish, felt so good. So good for me personally. I didn't care who was gonna read it at that point. It was, it was for me. It wasn't for, it wasn't for any of you that, that might read it afterwards. This article I wrote for me. But the resulting of it was that I had a whole bunch of people reach out. You know, people um, sent me uh, messages on Twitter, they, they um, slid into my DMs uh, they <laughs> uh, to share their stories. Some people that hadn't been confident telling anyone that they were experiencing this felt that level of courage because they'd seen that you know, if Aaron can write this post and, they can share, and he can share his experience with the world, well, maybe I can at least share my experience with him and, and he can give me some advice. Um, I got people... Uh, from Microsoft um, internally uh, reaching out to me, um, like, and some really senior people that shocked me. Like, I had no idea that they kind of knew who I was and stuff like that. Um, one of my best mates in Melbourne that I, I hadn't spoken to for a couple of months, you know, just how you, you know, that kind of friendship where you know, you go a couple of months without speaking, but you know, it's not a big deal. Um, he, he read the, the blog post and he reached out just to check in and see how I was doing. Was there anything that he could offer in support uh, of me? And it felt really, rewarding to me to, to see that I wasn't alone in this journey that I was going through. About a week after, or a couple of days actually after I wrote that blog post, um, our, our GM uh, reached out to me uh, at work. Uh, so that's my, my manager's manager's manager, so three levels above me, reached out and said, hey, read this blog post, um, can, can we have a chat? I wasn't surprised necessarily that they'd read it, um, Apparently, it got circula circulated around our leadership team. So they're like, yay, all of my leadership team has read this, and I haven't told, I hadn't really discussed it with anyone um, much at work, but, but he reached out because he wanted to, he wanted to have a conversation about that, about um, what was to be next. Um, and, and I, and I, because I'd already expressed to my skip that I wanted to move teams. So he, uh, he asked me a question that I was expecting. Because um, in the blog post, I talk about the fact that I'd been through you know, eight managers at this point, and uh, he said to me, well, so you talk about one of the, the leading contributors to your burnout was the number of managers uh, that you'd had, like you'd constantly had this change in your team, uh, or sorry, in, in, your, in your role and your management chain and things like that, and are you sure that having a new manager is the thing that you want? Like, you've said that management change is a contributing factor, and your request is management change. I asked Dali to generate me an image of sticking to your guns. <laughs> That's what it came back with, and I just I could have not put it in the slides. Why is there a pirate ship? I don't understand. Isn't AI cool? Back on topic. I said yes. Um, yes, I was confident that this was the right decision for me. And we, we had a really open and honest conversation. Like, uh, uh, maybe advocacy was no longer the right place for me. Maybe it was time to look you know, for other roles with inside of Microsoft that might be a better fit for the things that I wanted to achieve. And we talked about what my long-term career goals were at Microsoft. Maybe it was time to start executing on those. But I was still confident that, I, that advocacy was the right thing for me. I just, it, it wasn't, the space that I was in specifically around JavaScript was not the right space for me anymore. Um, and that I felt that .NET could be a better home for me, or it was going to be the right home for me. And my, my manager, was, uh, sorry, my, my GM wasn't asking these questions to try and dissuade me or to, to, to get me to do something completely different. The reason they were asking me these questions was to make sure that I'd properly thought through 
what I was asking, to make sure that I'd explored all possible avenues of where, this, uh, where I could be going and what could be next for me and what could help me recover from my burnout experience. Um, uh, and uh, ultimately, uh, we, we agreed to that I would move across to the, the .NET advocacy team. It was really just a lateral movement with inside of our organization. I didn't move, uh, I, uh, I still ha actually retained the same skip until about three weeks ago when they got moved off. You know, Manager change, yay! Uh, but I've had the same manager now for about 14 months, and that's like that's the longest time I've had a manager um, at Microsoft. Which, and and it it has been it's been a very positive change for me um, that move. So that's it. I'm cured. Yes, right. Like that's that's what happens. You you, know, you, you find your stressor, you address your stressor, and you yeah, it's problem solved. Job done. We can go home. Well, no, that's not how it works. I don't think I'll ever be cured because I don't think this is burnout isn't something that you cure. You just learn how to adapt and how to understand it and how to mitigate the chance of it happening again. So I said I, I joined the .NET advocacy um, and my my new boss obviously understood where I was coming from, understood the reasons that I was joining their team. Um, uh, and we, we sat down to make a plan. I, uh, I, I was going to finish off January in the JavaScript team before transitioning across, so I had some projects I had to wrap up and a few things like that. It turns out I was actually delivering some work, so I had to make sure that I, I finished those off before uh, handing them across to the rest of the team to, to look afterwards. But we needed to work out what was going to be the plan um, going forward. So I look back at the, kind of the, the six months that had preceded this, and there was... One thing that I'd been doing that uh, that I could actually well, really point a finger at and remember that I had actually been contributing to, and I'd been working with an engineering team, but it was all .NET work. Um, so it wasn't relevant to the role that I had in JavaScript, um, So, but now it was going to be relevant in the .NET space. So we worked out how to feed that into the objectives that we had in the .NET team so that I could contribute, could, could contribute to that still, um, but still have it and not have to kind of sneakily do it, do it as something that was going to be representing impact for me um, and, and be seen as a positive outcome. Uh, we started, uh, we, we just, um, decided on a, a new project um, that we were going to be tackling with inside of our team in conjunction with some sibling teams around um, uh, DevDiv at Microsoft uh, and, and work on those uh, with them uh, and build out a kind of a, a plan of work for the next six to 12 months. Um, so we, we, we had, some, had some, some goals, but we had some realistic goals. We knew that, I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't cured or anything like that, but I was going to try and make steps to become more productive, to be more impactful with inside of what we were doing. There's been setbacks along the way, and as, as, as to be expected. One of the projects that I was working on, um, uh, partner teams we were working with, uh, for a variety of reasons, things got delayed. And, uh, but this time, instead of looking at it like, oh, well, we'll just wait another week, and then it becomes, to next month, this next quarter, we looked at way, the ways that we could pivot the objectives that we had so that we could identify those, uh, we, we could still continue along the overall goals that we had even if the way that we were achieving them was slightly different. Um, and as a result of that, uh, we, we were still able to, to meet the things that I, I'd personally set out to try and achieve in the first six months that I joined the, the team. I also got back into running. Um, I'm, I'm someone who, who enjoys running. And look, I, I did run a lot through 2022. But I realized that in 2022, the kind of running that I was doing was, it was an escape. I was doing it because it meant that I didn't have to go to my desk. I didn't have to sit there and stare at a computer because I could go, out, I could go for a run. I could do something else. I could take my mind off the, the tedium that was the work that I was trying to avoid doing anyway. Um, in 2023, I set myself some different objectives around running. Uh, I, was, I had some, some PBs that I wanted to hit at a couple of events, and uh, I, I managed to achieve those by setting, I, I put together a training plan. These are the sorts of things that I wanted to do. I wanted to, um, you know, milestones along the way. And ultimately, I managed to hit them. And then the back half of 2023, I managed to hit a goal that I'd set myself for a couple of years' time, very unexpectedly in, in my running journey. Um, and. and and what I realized is that now I was running for the enjoyment of it. I was, yeah. I don't think anyone that doesn't run for fun understands the concept of running for fun. <laughs> it's very hard, like, what do you mean, fun? It's a hard one to explain. 
Uh, like, I, I did 7Ks this morning before coming to this event because it was fun. And I can still stand up. <laughs> I ran two park run. That's why it was 7Ks. Well, ran there and back. Um, but then I also started getting more involved with my kids' sport. Like, I, I, I wasn't not involved with my kids' sport um, previously, but I, I became the fill-in coach when our, uh, our main coach of our, of our kids' football team wasn't able to, to attend games. Start, uh, helped build up training drills and things like that. Well, I mean, as, as good a training drill as you can do for an under-eight soccer team. It's not just hurting cats. Um, and, and things like that. So that I, and I was, I was doing that not because it felt like a... It was some busy work that I was trying to, to keep my mind off things. I was doing it because it was, again, it was fun. It was giving me a sense of purpose again. Six months into my uh, tenure in the, the .NET team, we had our interview reviews again. And I went into this with a level of trepidation. Um, I, I'd been having very frequent one-on-ones. Like I was doing weekly one-on-ones with, with my manager. So I was getting uh, a lot of feedback along the way. I, I, uh, and we, we were working out where to pivot and things like that when things weren't working or, or we were getting um, roadblocks uh, on objectives that we had. But I still wasn't quite sure how this was going to play out. Like I said, the previous one, the undertone was that a pit was in my future. Was that still going to be the case? Because now we're not just looking at you know, the feedback directly from my manager, but we're looking at from the, the, the other teams that I'm working with, from HR and, and things like that. And the, the feedback that I received was that if you looked at my at the, at the previous 12 months, the first six months, if I hadn't changed anything, yeah, ah, there was, I was going to be on a pip. Um, potential manage out scenario sort of thing. If you ignored that six months, it was a radically different story. Um, I, the, the feedback that I was getting was overwhelmingly positive from everyone that I'd been working with and all that sort of stuff, all the people... Um, uh, all all the, the sibling teams, um, all the people that were seeing the contributions I was making. And that was really validating to me because I felt like I'd been making progress. But to get that feedback, not just from my manager who you know, I was talking to you know, multiple times a week, but from people that I worked with on occasions, they were seeing that there had been a radical change in the way that I was working with them. And that brings us to today. Look, I'll be honest, there are still days where I'm sitting at my computer and I feel like I'm just zoning out, that you know, there's an ever-growing backlog of work that I should be doing and I just don't feel like I'm achieving it or I, I can't be motivated to do it. But I think that's part of the human condition, right? We all feel that way at points in time. The difference is that I can now identify that as something that's happening to me and... and look at what are, the, what are the stresses and the triggers that are causing me to not be motivated to tackle that bit of work or to you know, um, contribute to whatever I'm expected to do at this point in time? Or is it just, you know, I, I need a day of mental health break because if I don't, we're going to be back at, um, at step zero and we're, we're going to be doing this journey all over again. I'm still having um, weekly one-on-ones with my manager, um, making sure that we, we, we're identifying potential problems early on. Um, how do we you know, reduce workloads uh, where are needed? And they've given me the confidence to start pushing back more because that's something that I, I'm, I'm the kind of person that will say yes to every bit of work that gets thrown at me because I, I, I want to get it done. I want to be, I want to sh be shown to be you know, a positive contributor. But I've now been given more of the confidence to be able to say, Actually, no, I don't have the bandwidth to tackle that pushback. And getting that support, because I, I, again, looking back at the, the history that I had, I, I hadn't felt I had that support to say no to a bit of work. You know, everything had to be done. I had to, to keep saying yes, because without that, you know, it wasn't gonna, I wasn't going to be able to, to deliver on what we were expected. No one can tell you how to recover from burnout. All I can do is I can share my journey. I'm lucky enough to be someone that is in a position that I can stand in front of an audience and I can share a journey that I've had. Not everyone has that opportunity. And I feel as someone who has that, I should take it to tell this kind of a story. Because if we don't, I'm just gonna end up like you know, my parents in the 90s where we don't talk about these problems. We don't talk about mental health. We don't talk about burnout. We don't talk about the challenges that we're having as, um, as individuals these days. You know, 
hopefully there's some things in here that have given you ideas on you know, if you're experiencing this or, or how you could recover if and when it happens to you. I can't guarantee that all of these sorts of things would be the right things for you, because again, the only person that can help you recover from a, a, a burnout experience is yourself. But the more we talk about it, the more we have advice and ideas, I'm at time, the more we know what we can do. Again, thanks to our sponsors. Thanks everyone for joining me. My name's Aaron Powell. If you want to reach out to me, there's my various social medias and things like that. Um, I will hang around for questions if anyone has them after the session. But again, enjoy the rest of the event, and thanks for having me.